I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. All right, what's up, world? Again, back here at Mix What I Like, Black Power Media. You've seen all these faces before. You know what it is. You know who's here. Mama Julia Wright, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, and Michael Schiffman. Welcome back, everybody, to the program. Let's get busy, because you all have been busy and have produced some powerful work here. We are deeply appreciative. Uh, I will pull it up on screen and let uh, you, Dr. Burroughs, uh, get us started here with what you've all done I, it's it's it, congratulations the, the the trials of mumia uh a biography in 25 voices is the book all right Tell well it. well thank you dr ball um i just want to say a couple of quick things off the top that i think are, are important to say uh because as we see we have some major guests here right so I want to say a couple of quick things. I'm going to put myself on mute, answer when spoken to. <laughs> um, the first thing I want to say is good morning to everybody. And I want to thank the person that is probably most responsible uh, for me producing this, my fifth book in the last 10 years. And that person is Dr. Jared Ball. Dr. Jared Ball has provided a platform uh, for me to write, which I very much appreciate. Appreciate, As I was telling people on Twitter, I think I've lost uh, material on like four websites right now. <laughs> and, and my root stuff is, is constantly fading. So to have a platform is, is very serious. And, and I want to thank Dr. Ball publicly because not only did he provide a forum for my two books that are online, but he also introduced me to my publisher, Dr. Kwasi Kanadu of uh, Diasporic Africa Press, and uh, because he was a, a classmate of Dr. Ball's at the Cornell Africana Center. So now the audience knows the secret, right? I, I'm not even the Robin to Dr. Ball's Batman, right? I'm, I, I'm more Batmite, right? <laughs> Look it up, non-geek people. Look it up. So that's the first thing I want to say. The, the second thing I want to say is, um, Dr. Ball, we, we talked in our pre-interview discussion about my... Um, chat appearance at the Schomburg Center. And, and I think I'm going to wait for a while before making that comment. I was originally going to put that comment here. But because mm. of these, these national events, I, I just wanted to say this. I wanted to give my last comment first, right? And then I want our, our major guests to, to speak. Um, we have now seen in the last few days a very naked opening salvo in the development of a white minority regime government in the United States. Um, and there's still some confusion about this. And I, and I don't know where the confusion is coming from. I think we're going to have to to reassess the leftist idea that there is one political party with two wings. I know that's popular to say. I know that's accurate in terms of the corporate structure that dominates these two parties. But I, but I think we're actually beginning to see some major differences between the two parties. We have a, a radical party that actually has an agenda, that says they're going to implement an agenda, that takes 50 years to implement an agenda, but they don't care, that stoops to any low thing they can go to under the ground, you know, to implement their agenda. And we have people surprised that they actually implemented an agenda they said they were going to implement for 50 years, right? Then we have a conservative party. Now, why do I call the Democrats a conservative party? Because it's they're really the conservatives in America. Because, because what are they trying to do? They're trying to stop the radical movement on the right, and they're trying to stop the radical movement on the left. They failed in their first goal and task, but they always succeed with their second. 
So we're going to have to actually reassess this. And we're going to have to be more critical of activists who buy $6 million houses for art. <laughs> we're going to have to start naming some names, right? Because had the sister bought the $6 million house for aging SNCC and Panther veterans, I think we would have been a lot more sympathetic to the idea of, yeah, maybe we do need a, need a $6 million house, right? But we're going to need some actual thinkers that are committed to Black liberation. And the reason why it's important to study Mumia Abu-Jamal is that he represents one of those last voices that is unapologetically militant and that is unapologetically decolonized. We, we've talked, Dr. Ball, on many of our appearances together about decolonized thought versus colonized thought. And Mumia represents this decolonized thought. So what I did was a couple of years ago, I gathered some of the top uh, writers and thinkers about Mumia Abu-Jamal, and we were uh, going to write this kind of book on critical essays about him, and I was going to supplement you know, some of the FBI files. That was the original idea of this book. But then Mumia got COVID on top of the other health problems that he has. And so I felt the need to document the Mumia's movement because they worked day and night for like two to three months straight to try to save his life because they're always trying to save his life, but particularly now with these medical issues. And so I wound up documenting that. And instead of doing the FBI thing that I wanted to do, that I guess I may save to another book, I decided to insert the Mumia movement's very brave and very selfless activism in trying to save his life from COVID. And so I had that. And then I had as you see some of the top writers in the radical world, Michael Schiffman, Julia Wright, and a bunch of others to supplement me in this. And so I want to also thank them for that, because when I look through this book, I'm really impressed with how this book says a lot of things about Mumia and that it, it, it is, to forgive the cliche, more than the sum of its parts. So that's that's pretty much uh, you know what I wanted to say. Well, I definitely appreciate uh, 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 all of what you said. One little correction is that uh, uh, Dr. Cornadu uh, preceded me at the Africana Studies and Research Center at Cornell under the 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 the, the director of its founding director, Dr. James Turner. Uh, but uh, um, and and I was said to have followed in his footsteps as a Turner Wright, um, which some used to actually say it with derision. And I was like, wow. that's a compliment. Wow. Yeah, you know, people always hate on, you know, they don't they don't like that people get liked. So, <laughs> but anyway, uh, so that's, th with that little bit of a correction, I appreciate all that you said and, and definitely appreciate the work. And I just wanted to show a little bit of the table of contents because when you talk about who you've got in terms of a roster, uh, it is thoroughly impressive, including the two guests we have here. Mama Wright, good morning to you. Welcome back. Uh, let me invite your any initial comments you have or thoughts that you have about the work here and it's it's timing value well thank Obviously, you it's for subject. having me and for having michael and for representing international mobilization for mumia here i want to echo angela davis when she said a few months ago at a seminar on Mumia and political prisoners, that if it were not for international mobilization, she would not have been released. So I, my heart goes out to the Mumia committees in Europe in particular, uh, Germany, the UK, France, the Basque country, Austria, what have you, for their obstinacy in the face of all the COVID waves they've withstood, the anti-vaxxers protests that are peculiar to Europe in their violence, and now Ukraine. And I just want to say 
how magnificent those committees have been. And I'm not, I'm leaving myself out because I'm no longer a committee. Okay. And so since we're having such bad news, dark news, I'm coming with a good piece of news today to gladden your hearts. A city in France, other than Paris, which has stood up for so many decades, for Mumia is now being added to the map. And that city is very symbolic of the slave trade traffic. It is the port of Nantes. Nantes, on the East Coast. It is the Liverpool of France. It has just sent an email in to say it will stand up for Mumia on the 3rd of July, which for us symbolically is well. It, it's like it, sh it sends shivers down our historical spines. <laughs> Thank you. Can I, uh, since you said that, Mama Julia, uh, forgive me, everybody, but I have to troll our audiences. And I just need to let everybody know that that uh, if you want to support that city that has just uh, shown its support for Mumia, uh, their football club is, is this is FC Nantes. <laughs> that's their football club. So, folks, you can uh, just want to let folks know, as I know so much of our audience hates the world's most popular sport, but that's one way that, you know, anyway, so shout out to all the football fans. Anyway, just playing. Uh, Michael, welcome back to the, to the program. Uh, we heard Mama Wright talk about the, the importance of international struggle and solidarity. France and Europe in general get a hard, you know, they get a hard way to go on this program in general, this platform in general, but, but, but we do acknowledge that, you know, when, when, you know, when certain things get done correctly, we want to appreciate it. Uh, you've been part of uh, sort of the correct side of European politics uh, in support of, of Mumia. So maybe if you want to say anything about that uh, or add anything else to what's been said, again, welcome back. Uh, uh, and please go ahead. Yeah, uh, very glad to be here. Well, uh, we are, uh, I think, all long distance runners. Uh, I joined this movement in 1999, uh, sparked by the second execution order against Mumia, and I thought it would be over in two years. And here we still are, but <clears throat> we are not going away. And the good message, uh, I think, is uh, we have better chances uh, to free Mumia than we had in two decades. And now really is uh, the moment uh, to once again rally nationally and internationally. I also have maybe uh, good news. Uh, I have approached a major publisher in Germany, West End, who publishes Chomsky and uh, other very good uh, literature uh, with the project of a translation of Mumia's book, Writing on the Wall. And uh, well, I should be cautious, but it looks very good. And not only will this book contain writings by Mumia, it will also contain uh, an elaborate discussion of the case and uh, parliamentarians in Germany uh, have been instrumental recently, both with regard to Mumia's health and with regard to trying to prevent uh, his execution when uh, that was on the agenda in 1995 and uh, 1999. And if they read this, uh, they will intervene again on the side of justice. And so uh, we are at a critical and crucial moment. Michael, if I can just stay with you for a quick second. You, um, uh, the title of, of your contribution uh, is uh, The Good Old Frame Up, How Police Prosecution and the Courts Turned Mumia Abu-Jamal into a Murderer. 
could you say a little bit about what you were saying in that in that piece uh and and uh tell us a little bit about what we'll read um when folks get the book and and so I, I am working off the 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 PDF you sent and I appreciate that although my I, I just want to say publicly that my my order is in uh for the hard copy so um and and I also want to say while we're all here you all and others will be invited back um once I uh um finish reading everything more thoroughly and um you know uh want to get to more of it and we need to have more than one just one hour on it anyway so but anyway michael what what were you trying to say or are you trying to say in this or are saying in this in your in this chapter yeah let me briefly say something about the other contributors like you i haven't read the book yet from cover to cover but each contribution really is worth it because uh, there are so many facets to the case and uh, Todd really captured this wonderfully in this compilation. So everything <coughs> is highly recommended. What I wanted to say, well, uh, I have concentrated in my work uh, mostly uh, on the criminal aspects uh, of the case. That's what I researched most uh, thoroughly. Of course, we all know uh, there is uh, one very crucial uh, aspect that's central to the case, and that's uh, epitomized in uh, Judge Sabo saying, uh, yes, and I'm going to help them fry, it follows uh, the N-word, uh, which is monstrous uh, with regard to two aspects. Uh, for one thing, a judge uh, who is ready to frame a defendant and the other is uh, the racial thing uh, that we know. And uh, that goes uh, through this whole case right from the beginning. When Mumia was found almost fatally wounded at the scene, <coughs> and the cops began to stump him and to call him names and uh, to, I hate to say the word, to niggerize him. <coughs> Black mother, Furka, and so on and so forth. Uh, they almost killed him. And what I've been trying to do is in this article is uh, I give a potential scenario of uh, what might actually have happened. And I think it's quite likely we can't prove it. We can prove uh, a certain amount of things, uh, but uh, I can't prove the version that I'm giving here. And what I think happened is uh, we had a brutal cop who bet up Mumia's brother, bet him bloody. Well, that's documented. They have photographs of uh, Billy Cook, Cook uh, uh, beaten and bleeding. And then uh, Mumia comes to, to the scene trying to help his brother, and the cop does uh, what thousands of cops uh, do in the United States shoot first, ask questions later. And then a third man, uh, Billy Cook's best buddy, Ken Freeman, acts in what I would call collective self-defense and kills the cop. That's basically what I think uh, happened. That's the most likely version. Wait a minute, wait a minute, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm sorry. Say that last part again. <laughs> well, uh, Actually, uh, and that's something that the cops and the prosecution tried to suppress uh, right from the beginning. It was not just uh, Officer Faulkner and two other people at the scene, namely Mumia and his brother. There was a third man who ran away. And this uh, third person, we know the Id identity because uh, Billy told it, told it to his lawyer, days after the shooting and his lawyer told uh, journalist Dave Lindorf. So we know who that was. And this uh, third person is the most likely killer of Officer Faulkner. I'm not saying murderer, because as I said, uh, this guy, Ken Freeman, saw how his buddy Billy was uh, beaten uh, senseless and then he saw Mumia shot and then he did something that was quite rational. Uh, 
he he stopped Faulkner from going even further. And uh, he managed to get away. Mumia couldn't couldn't run away and Billy wouldn't. They decided to put Billy to one side and uh, to frame Mumia. And that happened, that must have happened very quickly. Uh, there was a high officer by the name of Alfonso Giordano at the scene. He was uh, at the scene within five minutes and he knew Mumia. And when, when he saw him at the scene and the dead cop next to him, he knew what to do. And uh, he's the most likely uh, initial organizer of the frame up. Now, now Michael's view is um, very uh, dominant in terms of when we look at the, the crime scene. And, and, it, and he admits that he can't prove it. But, but let's talk a little bit, Michael, about what we can prove which I think is more than sufficient. There is an oh, article, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. There's an article in the book about where Dave Lindorf, another expert on the Mumia case, yeah. and Lynn Washington, whose photos and articles are throughout this book, where they do the gun test. Because, you know, the police yeah. talked about, oh, the angles. Here and, there. and by the way, Michael Shipman was yeah. one of the first people to point out that, that there was no way in the world that these gun angles could work or whatever. And he pointed this out in his doctoral dissertation, which is now a book. See, Michael's actually been to the crime scene. Michael has done the investigative work, he and, and Dave Lindorf. But Dave Lindorf and Lynn Washington took an extra step, Dr. Ball and audience. They did their own gun test. And they showed yeah. there was no way that it happened the way the police said it did. Now, you add to that, that Michael Schiffman is also the person that found the crime scene photos and found that the that the uh, that the photos show the fo I'm I'm saying the photos show that the crime scene was tampered with. Yeah, so, and that's so, uh, that's really right, that was right. done in, in well. Most, I remember uh, when, when even when Lynn Washington was here in talking about it, he was talking about how he showed up at the crime scene hours later and and nobody had been there, like nobody was there, right? Like like yeah. like every it was just a, it was just open to this to the world, much less the police, you know. Uh, um, I mean, not hours later, but not not that many hours later. He was it was in yeah. other words, it should have still been cornered off and it wasn't at all but anyway sorry michael go ahead yeah yeah it, it was uh, it was kind of crazy and uh, this guy uh, petro polakov uh, who i discovered by virtue of his name uh in 2006 uh, a photo popped up on the internet uh, which i didn't know about the crime scene picturing the crime scene and fortunately for me, the name of the photographer was not Peter Miller or something, but Pedro Polakov III. And there are only three persons in the United States by that name. And when I dialed, uh, the first one was my hit. <laughs> and he said, yes, I took this photograph. Uh, didn't bother about the case for 25 years. It's interesting that you are now calling me. Uh, and I had a very extensive email conversation with him, not telling him anything about what I thought. And at the end of that conversation, when we discussed all the photos, uh, I finally said, uh, well, now I'm going to say what this is about. Uh, and he said, uh, oh, I already know. Something isn't kosher in the state of Denmark. <laughs> So uh, he said, I don't know who killed that officer. I don't know whether Mumia did it or not. And as far as I'm concerned, I'm not even an opponent of the death, uh, of the death penalty. But uh, this guy didn't get a fair shake. He at least has, has a right to, to a fair trial with all the facts. And some of the facts are on the photographs. And uh, let me briefly uh, illustrate, let me briefly elaborate what this test was about that uh, Dave Lindorf and Lynn Washington did. Uh, because uh, 
Very crucial uh, at Mumia's trial was the testimony by three witnesses who said that the killer, and two of them said they recognized Mumia as the killer, uh, stood on top of uh, the prone Faulkner who was already lying on the sidewalk and uh, fired several shots uh, at him. One of them, uh, one of the shots hit and uh, blew his, basically blew his brains out. All the other shots missed. And the logical question would have been to ask uh, what happened with those other shots. They should have been in the sidewalk, right? And all the photographs by Polakov and even the police photographs themselves show uh, there are no bullets in the sidewalk. And that's uh, where the brilliant test by Dave and Lynn comes in. Uh, they reenacted that with a concrete slab and uh, they fired into that concrete slab that was quite similar to the sidewalk uh, in 1981 at th uh, 13th and Locust. And uh, it's impossible to overlook the traces of the bullets. And I was uh, told the same thing by a medical examiner in uh, the town of my birth in Tübingen, who I interviewed at, le at length. And he said, even if the blood from uh, Faulkner's head had flowed over those bullet divots, uh, they would have been impossible to overlook. So uh, that tells you something about these uh, three witnesses. Uh, all of them lied. And, <laughs> and uh, even more, they told the identical lie. How can that happen? We all know how it happens. Uh, they were told what to say. And this is uh, where another fact about this case comes in. Two of, the, uh, two of those witnesses, those who identified Mumia, did not even see the shooting. We can prove that now. So that already should be enough for uh, the district attorney's office to say we have to throw, the minimum what we have to do is we give Mumia a new trial. And, but, and Michael, I know, if, I, if, I, can add, if yeah. I can just add one more thing, since we're talking about the district attorney's office, we can point out the, the last thing that we can, we can show the, the frame up, right? where in uh, D.A. Krasner's office, he found all of this back paperwork and he found a note by, I think it was, it was Chaubert, right? One of the witnesses, yes. right, Chaubert? It was a cab driver. Right. It was and a cab driver who said, mm -hmm. who said he was parked behind Officer Faulkner's car and saw the shooting from there. We know that he was not there because right. uh, that's, uh, for example, shown on the Polakov photos. And Polakov to this, to this day is positive uh, there was no cap. There are other witnesses uh, who say there was no cap. And uh, what popped up in the boxes that Todd just mentioned uh, at the end of 2018 was a letter by that cab driver, Robert Schobert, to prosecutor McGill. And very short letter can basically be summarized with the words, uh, where is my money? <laughs> so uh, you can hardly get any better than that. So not only is it proven that the guy was not even there and testified falsely, we now even have evidence that he got money for it. What else do you need to throw a case out? I mean, again, I would have thought, well, anybody would have thought that just once, once, as you said, what J Judge Sabo was her, you know, documented as saying, I mean, that should have been a wrap right there. But, um, Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, never mind all that you've all just, you know, talked about, which again, barely scratches the surface uh, of everything that I know is in this book and that 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 I know just from over the years that these contributors have have put out that there actually is here. Uh, uh, Mama Julia, can I let me ask you about uh, your contribution, this open letter to Governor Tom Wolf? And I'm and I'm just wondering in general, um, you, I'm trying to I was trying to think of, you know, like how how you see not only what you said, what you were writing to the governor, 
but but uh, um, the the general sort of the state of the relationship between the struggle to free Mumi and political prisoners and the p- overall political apparatus, or even the the, the 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 zeitgeist of the broader societal political moment of today. In, um, in yeah. other words, what does your letter to Tom Wolf suggest about where we might be overall? Mm. Well, it was politely suggesting something very impolite. Um, my message, which he chose not to hear, and I'm not surprised, uh, is that um, he's afraid of Mumia for a very, very definite reason. And that's what connects our 25 voices. We've been taught by Mumia. We all have been marked by his teachings, his political thought. Mumia is a teacher. He's a leader who was uh, targeted by COINTELPRO, of course, but more than a leader, he's a teacher. And it's his teaching that the state makes a deep, deep mistake about. Instead of using that teaching to recapture our youth, they're squandering that teaching, they think, by putting him behind bars. Meanwhile, our youth is dying in our streets for a lack of such teachers. In quotes, because those teachers are still teaching. And that's the beauty of Mumia. That's the beauty of uh, uh, all the others, all the other political prisoners. Uh, Russell Maroon Schultz, while he was alive, uh, uh, Sundiata, uh, uh, Mutulu, all of them teach, they teach relentlessly and the state would, would stop them and is trying to stop them but can't silence them. And my message to Tom Wolf and the others is, if you would only face the truth, the final truth, that you are shutting up the best teachers your country has, then perhaps there would be some future for you politically. But they've lost it. They've lost it. They didn't, they're not hearing it. They've lost it. But Mumia is winning. He's already won, even though he's behind bars. And I just want to end what I'm saying by a story that Mumia left me with in the early 90s when he was on death row. Uh, He told me about the chemical companies that were uh, pouring their waste in the river near his prison and polluting the river. And what a crime it was. And I said, oh yeah, terrible. And he said, yes, but Julia, they're poisoning their own children because their own children are swimming in that river and their own children are breathing that air. Wow. Now that is, wow, I don't, you know, the thing about Mumia is that he sees beyond fact and he transmits to us something beyond journalism, something so deep that when you get shooters 
in Buffalo or Uvalde, you begin to understand that they are those children, those failed children, those lost ones, those Frankensteins of the system. I don't know. I, I hope I hope you and he are right. Uh, but when I hear that story, all I hear is that they don't care because their children are not swimming in that water. Their children are not getting shot up because this is not happening at the elite private schools. And this is not yeah. happening in, in, you know, and, and at least they think that their children aren't breathing that that air even because they think that they're far enough away uh, from the pollution that that, that, that they're creating. Um, but I, I I appreciate your point, and I and I ultimately hope uh, uh, you both are right. The, can, the, I, the, can I, can I jump in with a uh, with a crackpot idea? I I think Dr. Ball is correct, and I want to tell you why. The Spook Who Sat by the Door is one of my favorite books and one of my favorite movies, right? And The Spook Who Sat by the Door was made because uh, the people who made it, you know, lied to the Hollywood people and said, oh, you know, we're making this black exploitation movie, whatever. They didn't know what the content was. It was just the black exploitation was in. So they just gave it money and they didn't know what the book was, right? And we know this book has been repressed, right? It, it only came back out when I was 20 years old. That's how I discovered it. I think there's a new movie we need to look at that is now the equivalent of that movie. And it's a Hollywood movie it's a sci-fi movie, and it stars Matt Damon and Jodie Foster, and that movie is called Elysium. Now, what is that movie about? That movie is about what I think is what's really happening. Why, why is this white minority regime being formed, right? Because it's a transitional government, right? <laughs> because I agree with Dr. Ball. Mitt, Mitt Romney's great-grandchildren are not going to be breathing this air, not going to be swimming in this water, because Elysium is about the rich live in space and the poor live on the ground and earth. And, and the whole movie, is it's, it's like a sci-fi version of the, the Denzel Washington movie, John Q, right? It's about health care, right? Matt Damon risks his life to get health care for his sister. So he has to go up to where the rich people are. So when we look at what's going on with Bezos and all these people setting up the whole space travel thing, we see what's coming. They're not going to live here. And and I think that's why they've set up this white minority government <laughs> so or, or setting it up so they can make that transfer. Now, I know that sounds really crackpotty this early in the morning, but I think when you watch Elysium, particularly in the eyes that we have to now watch it with what's been going on in the state. It's one of the more, it, of all the sci-fi films I've ever seen, it's one of the more plausible that I, that I could see actually happening. Uh, but real quick, cause I, I don't want to go too far away and we got a nice super chat here. Thanks to Don Deering. Who's asking a question. I think the three of you can, can tackle here. What is your take on Arnold Beverly's confession and the implications that he was paid to assassinate Faulkner because uh, was cooperating with one of the three federal investigations into corruption. Ah, yes, the we don't talk about Bruno of the Mumia movement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes. Um, Arnold Beverly is Bruno. Is that we is don't that, talk is, about <laughs> Bruno? No, no, no. We don't talk about Bruno. Wow. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna answer this politely. And if Michael and Julia want to want to bring on something, they're welcome to. See, Dr. Ball, I went and got experts. OK, I went and got experts. That's why that's why I appreciate their work. One of the experts is Dave Lindorf, who wrote a scathing article about Mumia's lawyers at the time, Elliot Grossman and Marlene Kamish, who had been waiting in the wings because there were forces within the Mumia movement that have been pushing this Arnold Beverly theory from day one. And they were being held back by Mumia's lawyers who were trying to get him out. In fact, now, Lindor says that they deep sixed Beverly <laughs> now, as, as, a, as a witness. I right. could have proven Jamal's innocence, Abu Jamal's innocence. Anyway, now, yeah, sorry. Now, let me explain the content. Mumia was getting older. He was beginning to realize that maybe he wouldn't get out. 
And so, you know, he gave some very, you know, mainstream lawyers a chance. And so he decided to give these radical lawyers a chance. And, excuse me, they concocted this, this Arnold Beverly theory that, that doesn't hold up. And Lindorf does the, the expose on these lawyers, how shaky and fraudulent they were, and how this was a major setback uh, for the movement. Is, is that fair, uh, Julia Wright, Michael Schiffen? Is that a fair? Oh, I, I think that's uh, that's absolutely uh, fair. And I think uh, I say this as uh, one who believed in the story at first. Uh, we even put out a book in uh, in Germany, uh, which uh, championed did. But uh, on second thought, if you really look closely, the story doesn't make any sense. I mean, for one thing, it paints uh, Faulkner as uh, a virtual hero and saint, which he was not. And uh, on the other hand, I think the most succinct... Uh, mm, Uh, comment on the whole Beverly story was made to me by Lynn Washington in 2001 when I first met him. So there is an elaborate scheme, two people who don't even know each other, that's how the Beverly story goes, they meet at the crime scene and without coordination they <laughs> start shooting and then uh, they run away. <laughs> and uh, They do that right in Center City in Philadelphia. And uh, Lynn uh, said to me, well, if the cops really wanted to, to uh, get Fog rid of Faulkner so badly, why didn't they just pop him? <laughs> uh, lure him in a lone alley and, and just pop him. That would be the most rational thing. Like they always do, right? <laughs> and so uh, the, the whole story doesn't make any sense. And uh, I think uh, this can be discussed openly and uh, it can be re refuted uh, actually point by point. Uh, there is no need to deep six that. One can talk about it openly. I do so in, in my book, Race Against Death. Uh, and uh, I have done so uh, multiple times in interv interviews with Hans Bennett, who also has done a lot of terrific work on Mumia. And so, uh, from a rational point of view, uh, let's not divert from what the real story is. And the real exactly. story is that he was yeah. systematically framed, and this has nothing to do with Arnold Beverly, who is uh, apparently, that, that I was told by Mumia's former lawyer, uh, Dan Williams, a psychopath, and uh, the Mumia case was not the first time that he did this. Oh, I, uh, I, I shot, shot this guy, I shot this guy. And that's also why he passed the polygraph. Uh, we all know mm. that like, the psychopaths are, are very good at that. <laughs> mm. Okay. Um, okay, sorry, I just lost track of that. What, what else? Is... Oh, no, I can't. Oh, my bad, my bad, my bad. Um. So who else? What else is? What else should we? What else is there to cover uh, this I, morning? I, I, think, just, I think I think we may want to talk for. about. I think yeah. we may want to talk a little bit about. Um, and and that's why I was hoping we were going to have some some other guests on here. Um, we need to talk about the forty cities, uh, for Mumia movement, mm -hmm. that's happening over the holiday weekend. There are uh, forty cities, that, or the movement is asking for forty cities to have their own uh, rallies and demonstrations for Mumia around the country and around the world. I know my own city, Newark, uh, is going to have one. And of course, a named one will be, of course, in Philadelphia because the 4th of July is very important to the Mumia movement because it was around the 4th of July that the jury took, you know, 10 minutes, right, 15 minutes, <laughs> whatever it was, right, before they, they sentenced him to death. And, and, and this was so long ago, Dr. Borg, I want to say, that a death sentence then was the electric chair. Mm -hmm. So Mumia was originally sentenced to the electric chair. Uh, but there are 40 cities that are that are having a protest. The the event is being sponsored by the uh, a new force within the Mumia movement. Uh, 
you know, people my age, the so-called young people, right, of the movement, a little bit younger, the, the group Love Not Fear, uh, fear spelled P-H-E-A-R, they are the main sponsor of this event. And uh, this event is to uh, galvanize support uh, for Mumia. And, and by the way, I don't know if I've mentioned, but the proceeds of my book are going to go to Jericho and Love Not Fear and the, uh, the coalition. I'm not taking any money from this book. Uh, I learned a lot. Oh, I thought book. this was your retirement plan. No, <laughs> no, absolutely, your... absolutely not. Oh, my fault. Okay. I, I, learned, I learned a lot about, you know, doing this kind of work when I was putting together this book because, you know, I, I kind of heard Howard Zinn laughing at me from, from his realm of the ancestors, right? Because I'm trying to like put together like this critical, as I was saying, this kind of critical essays on Mumia, you know, where I want to historically assess him. And, you know, it's really good when you have the, the chance to historically assess somebody who's dead, right? It, it's kind of helpful if they're dead, right? It's, it's not as helpful when they're alive, and it's definitely not as, as helpful as if they're alive and under the gun, right? And Mumia is and, always- And alive with, with, vigorous, with vigorous support networks that reach right. out to you quickly if they right. feel like anything has been left out or done oh. improperly. Oh, and trust me, and I know about that. Trust me, absolutely. I have, I know about that. That's another conversation. And as they before. should, and as they should. You know what hey, I'm saying? Look, look, I but I... what I learned, but again, again, to go back to Howard Zinn laughing at me, what I what I learned was that Howard Zinn was correct when he said you can't be neutral on a moving train, right? So when this stuff was happening with Mumia, you know, almost you know dying of COVID. I had to decide, I said, okay, you know, you want to be this, you know, objective historian. This dude, this dude, they've been trying to kill this dude for decades. They're trying to kill him again, right? You have a role to play as an as a conscious person, as an African, you have a role to play. And I had to realize like I had to play that that role. And that's why I wanted to make sure that this that this material was documented. And so one of the things I learned was about this new movement, uh, Love Not Fear. And again, they're sponsoring events. Uh, around the country and, and around the world, and so this Fourth of July is going to be that weekend for for all for people who care about Mumia to get together and to talk about his case and to talk about the next steps forward. So I have I definitely have another question, um, but uh, Don Deering is 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 earning the right to ask uh, his. Uh, do you remember the title of Lindorf's or Lindorf's articles on the Beverly Confession? A quick search didn't find it. Um, thanks for the super chat, Don. And, and I would just, you know, obviously the experts can answer, but, but I would suggest, uh, just picking up a copy of this book. Cause I think Lindorf goes into this, uh, in, in his, his contribution here, but, um, do we no, have you want to say the, anything else? No, that's correct. The, the article we use by Lindorf is the article, uh, that is important. In fact, he even updated the article, uh, for me. And forgive me, I, I, I don't remember the title of the article, but it's right in the table of contents. Um, yeah, we, we suggested if you want the updated version of what Lindorf has written, that that's in this work. Yeah, and he um, also wrote yeah, it in Killing Time. In his, mm. in his big book, Killing Time, uh, he has an extensive discussion about this, which, uh, which is very, very convincing. Uh, so his 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 chapter here is updated version of Mumia's All or Nothing Gamble is the chapter in this book. Um, right. Uh, so one of the questions that I have is is that you know uh, a couple of uh, uh, names folks that contribute to this book uh, are um, sort of supremely prominent uh, for various reasons and and are people who have for in pockets of the actual political left have been criticized for for their various prominent public political performance. And I'm thinking specifically of Angela Davis and Colin Kaepernick. Um, so I'm just wondering what it means to have them uh, and figures like that as contributors to to this book. Um, and if, if, if you, Todd, or anyone that wants to say a word or two about what they have had to say, um, please do, but I'm, yeah. I, I, I appreciate that, that question. Um, you know, 
first, I want to say that that uh, this is this is my book on Mumia. It's it's a biography in Twenty Five Voices, not the biography. And this is my book on Mumia. It's not the uh, movement's book on Mumia, but it's me documenting that movement and asking movement people to participate. And I think that's important for me to say here. Um, because as I as I've said to the Mumia movement, you know, when when we had our you know private discussions about this book, I said I hope that they uh, you know th they have so many books to write on the the movement, the the Mumia movement itself. I mean, just a book of photos, as as Michael and Julia would know, if they just published all the photos they had, they would have a a, a fantastic book. Um, Dr. Ball, I, I I appreciate the gentle hate of the question. I'm going to. Uh, give you give you uh, a, a gentle hate response. I wrote my own critical article about Kaepernick and this move on Medium, right? And and that and that we had to have some discussions about that with members of the movement when I did that, because I I saw it as a desperate gamble, right? But but I wrote that article because that Kaepernick incident happened before the COVID uh, diagnosis. And again, you can't be neutral on a moving train. So I had to include Angela Davis's comments that she was making on Zoom because, again, the power of the Mumia movement. I mean, I've never seen anybody can get, you know, Angela Davis within 72 hours to have her schedule available to talk on Zoom. Like that taught me a lot about the Mumia movement. And, and, and again, I try to say in the introduction how people like, you know, Johanna Fernandez and others, you know, others who I did not mention, by the way, like Suzanne Ross, these people have dedicated their lives to Mumia. They, they have, they are, are in a life sentence as well, right? And so when Mumia is in jeopardy, they, they organize like, you know, it's like something out of the A-team or Voltron or something like that, you know? And so one of the things that they do is they get, is that they got Angela Davis to come in. And, and I'm glad that she did that because her name still carries a gravitas uh, for the world left that really brought a lot of attention to, to the movement. So, Dr. Boyle, I, I hear your hate. Your, your no, hate I mean, I'm, I'm honestly, <laughs> personally, I, I thought the question needed to be asked, but I'm personally- no, it did. It did. Like, I think, because I think whatever I think about other aspects of their, their behavior, so to speak, right. politically, right. I think that- people who come out in public vigorous support for Mumia and other political prisoners. I mean, right. it does cover up a lot of sins, so to speak. Uh, um, but I just, you know, anyway, do any, Dr. Do Ball, even, all, all's fair and love me? and hate, Dr. Ball, all's fair and love and hate. Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> speaking of the love, thanks uh, Norman Henderson for the super sticker. And uh, Don, again, appreciate you uh, coming through this morning uh, uh, and you're, that you'll double back and revisit uh, the suggested readings. Uh, does anybody else, Michael, Julia, do either of you want to say anything else about that particular question? Um, if not, we can, you know, I'm happy to move yeah. on or have you have yeah. you all wrap up. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, well, dang, unfortunately, we got to start to wrap up anyway. So, well, to wrap yeah. up, uh, yes, because I have drilling in my building of all things today. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, to come back to Mumia's story, which I defend because I heard it and it's words, it's gold in my ears, okay? I think what Mumia was trying to tell me is white supremacy is committing suicide. It does. He is seeing the weakness of our enemy and he is teaching us. So please hear that. <laughs> Okay, I know we're in doom and gloom, but hear that from him. Okay, now, uh, last year I put out a petition uh, against ethnic massacres and got, oh, I think some of you signed it. I know Michael did and got a lot of signatures from Germany. Wow. And the good news, I love good news. Uh, I'm not Pollyanna, but I love good news, um, is that Elaine, where the massacre, the Black Massacre in 1919 took place, 
three years after my own uncle was, great uncle was lynched there, is standing up for Mumia on July 3rd. And I am so exhilarated. Wow. I mean, to connect all these lynchings and massacres and to have a map where all these things are connected, whether they're forgotten or cold cases or buried or covered up, I love it. And the other piece of news is that the place where the massacre of indigenous peoples is taking place in the Amazon, uh, at least the French part of it, French Guyana, Cayenne, the capital, is standing up for Mumia on July 3rd. So we're getting all the massacre sites, the historical massacre sites, to stand up for Mumia. Right on. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. Uh, and uh, since Julia loves good news so much, I also have good news, more good news. Uh, I have a new website, which I have now decided to, to popularize. And this is the first time I'm speaking about it in public. It's called uh, Drop the Case Against Mumiaabujamal.com. If you go there, not only do you find a long rebuttal of uh, the filing by the district attorney's office from 2021, where I really, uh, in a documented fashion, uh, disprove the whole case against Mumia. I also have a brief brochure of 20 pages, which you can download and which you can print out and which you can disseminate, and uh, with which you can and should go, particularly in Philadelphia, to the media and ask them, uh, why don't you report the real Mumia story, which you haven't done for 40 years? If uh, any time is the right time, the time is now. Mumia is again in court. It's uh, winning or uh, uh, continue to be jailed. So you have a responsibility. So uh, I invite you to go that to that website. There Say the website again. There. Drop the case against Mumia Abu Jamal dot com. All right, because it says it can't be reached when I'm trying to drop the case I'll put against mumiaabujamal.com. So I must have done something wrong. But yeah, drop it in the chat and I'll share it for sure. Um, well, first of all, you know, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, congratulations on, on this work. I know you've been working on it uh, uh, long and, and, and uh, I, I don't want to say difficult time, but I do have some idea of working with you previously on something uh, that editing is even with with loved ones and, and comrades editing an anthology is no easy business so congratulations on that shout out to to, to professor uh, conadu as well um uh for for diaspora africa press and i am dropping the link michael shared in the chat and i'll show quickly this website that does in fact work and is up. It's time to drop the case against Mumia Abu Jamal. And you can check out all of the Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ball. I, I just wanted to end with the comment that I that sure. I was holding. Uh I told you this in our in our preview conversation, and I think it would be a good good way to close this discussion. I was uh recently on a Zoom in the in the chat as a part of the audience. Um the Schomburg had a discussion about like post civil rights era, you know, America or something like that. And they had, um, you know, some major scholars on Elizabeth Hinton, who did that great book on, you know, the rebellions of the, of the 60s. And they had a white guy on who, um, you know, did a book comparing Reagan and Trump. Uh, believe it or not, he found some similarities and some uh, uh, continuity there. And then there was a white woman Duh. who did <laughs> an anthology mm -hmm. on, on, you know, radical writings in America, right? So I listened to all these people talk, and, and I, I just felt compelled, you know, because Dr. Ball knows I have absolutely no cooth. He knows this. So I went into the chat, and I said, look, 
every time I read one of these liberal analysis of, of our, our movement, it ends where all of the ideas of the radical black tradition begins. And I said, why can't, you know, my question to the panel is, why can't you just admit that Mumia Abu-Jamal and George Jackson and others were more right than wrong about the nature of America and the nature of, of the, uh, the police? Mm. And, I, you know, to the Schomburg's credit, they actually read my question to the panel. The only person who chose to answer it was, a, was the white woman because she had written this, this radical uh, anthology. So she provided cover for the other two people, right? So she went into what her book was, which I, which I appreciated. And then the Schomburg host said, you know, I sympathize with this question because I make sure to teach my students in class you know, the thoughts of George Jackson and, and others. But, you know, from the other two authors, it was silence, right? Um, we're going to have to, again, as we deal with this, this current and very naked environment, political environment, nakedly honest, thank God, right? Because, I mean, you heard what Clarence Thomas said. He said, oh, no, this is not enough, right? He wants contraception gone. He wants gay equality going. I mean, so again, they're honest and they've been honest now for 50 years, right? So, so what the Schomburg host talked to me about was something she called the politics of citation. That, that, that's what she called, you know, the dilemma that I was trying to, to bring up. I think we're going to have to, to start again being honest about the nature of American society. And I think, it's, I think we're going to have to really challenge people who refuse to bring up this entire wing of black thought that we know of not only as politically and culturally and, and, and socially and intellectually legitimate, but perhaps even more right than wrong. And, and as a biographer of Mumia Abu-Jamal, I mean, you know, as a biographer, I have my own critical questions about him. And, you know, we've talked about that at length, Dr. Ball. In other discussions, but what I what I don't have a problem with is clearly that he represents this level of thought that is not being integrated into the discussion. And by the way, I have a chapter on that done by my chair at Africana Studies at Seton Hall, Dr. Kelly Harris. He talks about Mumia Bujamal's contribution to Africana Studies. I would argue that he talks about Mumia Bujamal's non-contribution to Africana Studies because people in Africana Studies who are mainstream do not recognize him as being a historian or in Africana studies. They recognize him as being a political figure. So they're ignoring 10, 12 books, right? And there are some, and don't think I forgot this episode in, in our career, there are some who sit prominently in academic journals who will not accept and publish articles claiming the colonial relationship had not been properly demonstrated in an article you and I co-wrote about Mumia. And I will never, ever forget that. I probably still have the email and I'm probably going to call the person out when I don't have you all on screen to get dragged <laughs> down with me. Um, but because that was foul, but, but that happens all the time. People are, academia is really shady. So thanks again to Don Deering for, for the super chat and letting us know freemumia.com for more information on the buses. Listen, unfortunately I got, we got to go, uh, but, 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 We'll do this again, um, absolutely, uh, really, as soon as you all are available. Mama Julia Wright, thank you very much. Michael Schiffman, of course, thank you for joining us once again. And my man, Dr. Todd Stephen Burroughs, congratulations on uh, the Cute accomplishment. Dog. We look forward on your other forthcoming work on Mumia absolutely. as well, which we're staying tuned for. Um, and uh, like has been said, free Mumia Abu Jamal and free them all. Thanks again to all three of you. Appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Ball. All right, everybody, quick break and come right back with much more here at I Mix What I Like. Don't go anywhere. Thanks again to our guests and everybody in the chat. But do not leave. We have much more coming up right here on I Mix What I Like and Black Power Media. Peace. I mix what I, 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 mix, like, I, what I mix, like, what I, I like, mix, what I, I like, mix, what I, I like, mix, what I, I like, mix. what I like. Let me show these suckers how to ball out here. Oh, man, let me get this together here. Oh, layup. Oh, no. Shot. Oh, three. Three. Oh, it's like Brick City out here. Mid range. Oh. Goodness, I can't buy a bucket out here. I missed the whole damn basket. Oh my goodness, what's going on, man? My game is looking trash. Rap. Oh, here we go. Black Power Media shirt. Now we cooking. Now we cooking. Tree, tree. I'm 
taking all three of y'all with these right here. Between the legs. Oh my goodness, behind the back. Layup. Oh, did he just do a reverse? He is in beast mode out here. I ain't got to look, it's falling. Oh my goodness, this guy is going. Three, two, one. Kobe. Nice. Black Power Media, baby. Nice. Empower yourself. Go get you some of that Black Power Media again. Right here, blackpowermedia.org. Yeah.